everyone, it's Zena Dalla, your VertiCline Posture Coach, and I have the distinct pleasure today to interview Matt Chu, who is the founder of Upright Health. Hey, Matt. How's it going, Zena? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well this morning. I'm really happy and excited to have you here. Um, I want to let everyone know that I have Matt's bio in the blog post below and also in the description of this YouTube video. I've been following or stalking Matt now for a little over a year, and um, what attracted me to you, Matt, was that you have some really amazing certifications and education in the posture and alignment universe in the world that we all live in, and, um, and then since then, I've been following your YouTube channel, and if you're not following his channel, you really need to follow it. He has the ability to take very complex concepts and simplify them and break it down. And I always walk away with a real, some really concrete information. So Matt, I want to thank you for really putting out some amazing content out there in the posture world. You're welcome. Thanks very much for, uh, for that. Yeah. And please keep doing it because I want to keep stalking you. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, I asked Matt to come on and talk to me today because he has a program called the FAI Fix. And FAI is the femoral acetabular impingement syndrome. It's a problem that we have in the hips. It's something that I don't know too much about. I haven't really dealt with it as much as you have. And so I wanted to talk to you about that today, and I want to kind of dive right in. And I'm going to start by asking you to explain exactly what FAI is and who it really impacts the most. So um, this is actually, uh, it's, I'm really happy to talk about this. This has been a passion of mine for the last several years. Um, basically, FAI, the way it's uh, conventionally understood in the medical world is uh, you have your hip joint, which is a ball in a socket, and um, basically the belief medically is that the bones are growing wrong. So over time, you'll either have part of the socket kind of grow a little bit too much, so it kind of runs into the head of the femur, or you'll have the head of the femur grow a little bit too much. And the belief is that you could also have a combination of these. And the belief then is that those overgrowths lead to premature impact when you're trying to move the ball and socket. Uh, this is actually a relatively new diagnosis. Um, the The whole theory around this actually did not exist until the early 2000s. And uh, it was basically put forward by some surgeons who thought they had found an explanation for labral tears, for hip pain, for arthritis. They thought, well, maybe these bones, these bone variations are what's causing people's problems. And so they actually created a surgery where they could fully dislocate the hip joint, shave down the bones, and then put everything back together and fix it as far as they knew. Um, and then the procedure developed into arthroscopic surgery, and now basically you do arthroscopic surgery on this hip uh, pathology. The reason I use air quotes is because um, the basic theory is that those bones cause the problems. They cause the labral tears, they cause the arthritis, they cause the pain. On Subsequent research over the last 15 years has shown that there's actually no link between those bone shapes and pain. There's no link between those bone shapes and movement problems. There's no link between those bone shapes and people actually experiencing any of the symptoms that these bone shapes are supposed to cause. Um, you'll also find that the labral tears uh, don't seem to be linked, and the labral tears themselves aren't even linked to people actually having pain and other symptoms. So there's a whole host of things that medically, in the conventional medical world, are believed to cause people's hip pain and that are believed to need and require surgery to correct. When you then look at all this research and see that there's no links, um, you know, it provides an opportunity for people to realize, well, maybe there's something that we're missing in this whole picture. And um, with the FAI Fix, the, the program that I uh, co-created with my friend, really good friend Shane Dowd, um, we basically looked at it as how can we deal with muscles around the hip joint to make them control the hip joint better and to get them to stop sending pain signals. So um, that's wow. basically what the program is all about, is helping you figure out how to retrain the muscles around the hip to correct movement problems and to help you get more comfortable, more control, more strength, more range, and ultimately get you back to enjoying the things you want to do. What kind of person experiences this pain? I know I've seen some research on um, athletes or people who sit. I mean, can you clarify that? 
So uh, what's interesting is that this that people who have the hip pain and who get uh, the FAI diagnosis um, come from all kinds of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So um, like with many with many um, arthroscopic surgeries and orthopedic surgeries in general, the the big press, the big headlines usually comes out around the pro athletes. Right. So uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, National Hockey League players. Um, have been getting this diagnosis. Um, they end up with severe hip pain and the diagnosis is FAI and then they do the surgery. Um, so a lot of athletes get it. It's becoming popular, you know, popular in that sense. Um, but also a lot of people who are just sort of run of the mill desk jockeys, you know, who are just sitting all day long, the muscles around their hip joints no longer work properly for reasons you you and I both understand, right? You're sitting on your butt all day. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> so you get the pain, and um, if if somebody sees the uh, FAI bone shapes in an X-ray, and they do a couple different tests, and they do an MRI, maybe they do some physical tests to check your range of motion. If they see these things and see positive results on all these tests, then they'll say, "Well, you have FAI," and then the solution is surgery. Yeah. So it comes from any you know any walk of life you can end up with this hip pain and it makes it it's really interesting because the activity level seems to give you can give you hip pain i, I mean as a I, I used to play a lot of hockey and i d ended up with a lot of hip pain um and even with people who don't do anything who are very flexible they can still end up with hip pain and still everyone would get shunted into the same path of like here's your treatment it's to shave this bone. So can you, for people who are watching this who are like, gosh, my hip kind of hurts, can you just quickly tell me where that pain might be? And because that way then they, we can, you know, then I can go to Matt and try to get it fixed. So they can say, oh, well, maybe I need to be doing the FAI fix. So where is that pain exactly? So uh, the location that people get hip pain also varies a lot. So they're, they're medically, a lot of times they'll talk about the, a, a C sign. So they'll say like, oh, you know, you're making a C with your hand and then you're kind of cupping around the side of your hip. This is all totally fair game for where you might get hip pain. A lot of people get stuff through the front of the hip, just like right right at the attachment of the top of the quads. They can get it on the inner thigh into the groin. This area, actually, I'm just going to move the camera. We're friends, right? So, yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so right in here um, is where I think it gets most disturbing for people. Um, people will think that's my hip joint, and I'm having a lot of trouble directly in the hip joint. And um, one of the things I encourage people to do is crack open anatomy textbooks and really start looking at where things are because, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times this has happened. Somebody has said, oh, it's my hip joint. And they're pointing at really what's the attachment of a muscle to the pelvis. Yeah. But it feels really scary because, I mean, this is just not an area that most of us are familiar with. Right. We know where our biceps are, but we don't know what's going on in the groin generally. We're just yeah. sort of scared of it. We keep it covered all the time. So those muscles can feel like, oh, you're damaging something really bad. But in reality, you can calm down. It's, it's just a muscle. You can also get um, hip, you know, hip pain going around the butt, down the back here. It's, it's all really common, um, SI joint stuff. It can show up everywhere because basically you have, you have so many muscles around the hip joint that are going to affect your comfort levels. Whether or not you get the FAI diagnosis hinges on the x-rays and, and MRIs. And again, those things aren't really linked to the actual location that you feel the problem. So I could theorize that if I someone again who's watching this video who might have that pain, and by the way, that was really helpful to be able to see, um, and they don't, haven't gone and done the MRI, but they're having this pain, I'm assuming it can't hurt them to do these stretches and exercises you're about to share with us. Because at the end of the day, if they're sitting at their desk all day long, they need to be stretching their glutes or working their muscles, correct? Uh, that's pretty much correct, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, what I tell people is, you know, you, you have a choice when the pain starts hitting. You could say, well, it's this is a huge major joint problem and I should just not move. And the reality is if you don't move, you will not be able to move. Yeah. So you need to identify the movements that are helpful for you at this stage and continuously refresh and figure out what new movements you can add to your repertoire. If you consistently say, well, that hurts and I'm not going to do it, then eventually, and actually very quickly sometimes, you end up not being able to do anything. Yeah. 
Um, and you know, people will often be afraid of moving because they think they're going to do more damage. But I mean, you walk down the street every day, and there's a risk to doing that. So you know, if 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 you are comfortable getting in a car and driving, you should be comfortable just moving your hip a little bit and exploring and learning how to use some of your muscles a little bit better. So yeah. That was incredibly well said. I, I, I say that to clients all the time, how important it is to keep moving and keep the, the blood flow yeah. moving. Exactly. So you yeah. have a TSR technique, correct? Did I get that correct? And, yeah, the and what you use in your FAI fix program. So please tell us the T, the S, the R, and kind of how that all works. Yeah. So the T, S, and R are the initials for different sections of the program. So we talked about tissue work. T, and we talk about stretching S, and we talk about reactivation uh, R, right? So tissue work, um, we, we've set up as the first pillar of the program. It's basically teaching you how to do self-massage around muscles all around the hip joint. Um, this is typically an area that's really neglected in in the medical community, community, it tends to be extremely neglected. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with how how hard it has been for massage to even be taken seriously as something that could possibly help people with back pain. Yeah. Um, you know, it took decades for anyone to take it seriously. Um, but massage on the hip muscles can really help restore range of motion and function. That said, it's not the only thing you need to do, right? There depending on who you are, you may need other components, right? Some people, like, we, we tend to find really active athletes like CrossFitters, weightlifters, tend to get a lot of bang from the buck from doing tissue work to help relax muscles in a better way. Uh, the next component with stretching really helps you reestablish range of motion in a bunch of different movements. So um, a lot of people especially guys, have trouble touching their toes, right? Yeah. And, you know, in life, maybe that doesn't seem to affect you so much. You don't need to have a straight knee as you bend over to tie your shoes. But um, what it tells you is that the hamstrings are not able to do what they need to do to allow full hip range of motion. So if you are, say, a, you know, a soccer player or, for me, a hockey goalie, and those muscles aren't functioning correctly, then... When you're going to do a motion that requires it, you're going to compensate, yeah. and some yeah. other muscle takes the hit. So the stretching is to really help people identify areas where they're tight and reestablish good range of motion in those areas. Um, the reactivation section um, is a section that people really, um, really, I think, again, in the medical community, this kind of gets uh, underappreciated. Um, we really focus on trying to get people to tune in to muscles in a really mindful way, and then gradually get those muscles to be much stronger than they tend to be for people. So we really encourage people to first get mental connection to the right muscles and fire them in the right pattern, and then start building into more complex movements that involve weight. And using that weight, you start to be able to turn on your hamstrings better, you get to turn on your butt muscles better and, you know, just learn how to coordinate motion so you don't compensate when you're, um, you know, picking up a bag of groceries or you're trying to jump over a wall, like whatever, you know, whatever it is you're trying to do, you know, if you're trying to play golf or you're trying to do karate, like all those things require you to understand what muscle is supposed to fire and then get it to fire. Um, so yeah, so it, it really runs the gamut on reactivation. Actually, we'll, we'll start with simple stuff and then move into more and more, uh, complex stuff. I love that. I call that the sleepy muscles. <laughs> um, so I tell yep. my clients all the time, the muscles that are asleep, we need to wake them up again. And, and, um, as you know, I have a course too for uh, back pain and neck pain. And, and a lot of the muscles in the beginning are a lot of the exercises in the beginning of my course are very simple, but it, it's about getting that mind to really connect to the body. Um, yep. you know, you shouldn't be talking or watching TV when you're doing this, you should be really thinking about what your body is doing. And so yep. I love that. So, you know, you're in your space right now. So can you do some demonstrations for us and maybe show us pick one T or S or R, um, one of the, maybe one of each, if we have, if you want to fly through all of them, um, and oh, just yeah, give okay. us an example of kind of what we're dealing with when, if you've got that hip pain or FAI, you know, what's in your course. Uh, sure. Okay. So let me give you a quick rundown and let me empty my pocket here. <laughs> Addictive cell phone. I can't seem to shake. And uh, let me show you, show you a little bit. So with a um, real simple thing that people can do here, um, I mentioned earlier, like athletes, um, 
a lot of crossfitters, weightlifters tend to run into issues. I think you probably can't see my head there, can you? All right, there, there I go. am. Um, so for a lot of people, if they're doing, um, they're doing like a lot of running, biking also, a lot of times what will happen is the muscles of the front of the hip, the quads, will tend to just start getting really good at firing and not so good at relaxing. So the consequence of that is it actually starts to affect the pelvis position. It'll start putting you into what's known as anterior pelvic tilt, mm -hmm. which actually makes it really difficult to move your hip joint well. You'll, you'll, you'll lose range of motion pretty quickly in anterior tilt. Um, it'll also tend to give you some issues in the front of the hip. You'll start to feel like, ah, like pinches sometimes and possibly compress in the low back, and that's not super comfortable either. So uh, one of the exercises we... Uh, recommend people start trying is actually using either foam roller, this is a quad baller, you know, some, a softball even works, something to actually get to massage the front of the thigh here. So um, actually let me show you my right leg so you can see it. Basically, you know, it's as simple as coming down right up on top of this and gradually slowly working your way through dense, difficult areas that just feel like they're super painful. Um, it's pretty safe. There's not a lot of things you could hurt doing this, right? Yeah. You just find the areas that are a little bit tight and you hang out on them. We generally recommend people do these for at least two minutes to the five minutes, you know, take your time exploring and getting muscles to relax. Sometimes people will try to like muscle through this and yeah. we really encourage people to actually let the muscle relax into it. It's just sort of like letting butter melt rather than like trying to stab through a stick of butter. You Just let it ease through, right? Let it ease through. So you basically run from the top of the thigh all the way down towards, um, towards the knee and just not onto the kneecap and just searching for things like that. So that's not like a, you know, I think a lot of people have seen that exercise. It's not like a crazy groundbreaking thing, but what we, what we do in the program is set up the um, sequence that makes that more effective, right? So after you've done tissue work like that, you want to be doing things to help open up that same muscle. So um, an example of that with the stretching, in the stretching section, if we're focusing on quads, is uh, actually to do something like a quad stretch. Um, excuse me, let me just set this up. So Right. You can do something against the wall where you just, um, can you see that okay, Zina? Yeah, that sounds good. That's good. All right. So basically you can get your knee back here, get your foot up onto the wall and start coming up like this. Now, when a lot of people with hip problems first start doing this, they'll usually start coming up and go up and be stuck here, yeah. right? They may not even be able to get the foot on the wall. So you have to have regressions, which we do have regressions in the program to help you be able to start working towards this so that you can start opening up the hip joint, opening up this whole thigh muscle here. So again, especially, I mean, that, that tends to be a really helpful one for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, after that, there's, a, there's this window of opportunity for you to be able to activate your butt muscle is better. So once you kind of calm these guys down, it's easier for your body to use the posterior muscles. And that's when we start jumping into reactivation stuff, like doing bridges, um, which you know, can be, for some people, quite challenging, right? It's just being able to feel like you're using the correct muscles back here. Um, from, from here, you end up once you can actually feel the right muscles working, you end up loading this, you end up switching to one leg, you end up doing um, harder exercises like deadlifts and things like that. Um, another exercise that I, I don't want to neglect is like for an easier exercise for people who have some hip issues, especially people who are sitting a lot. Um, there are really simple things that can help kind of make this whole area more comfortable. So things like, um, Things like simple isometric contractions where you're just blocking blocking the uh, leg and then getting these muscles to fire mm -hmm. work really well. So um, for people who are you know sitting at the office, you can just do something like this and you're trying to pull up and your hand is just your hand and arm are just stiff arming here so that you're feeling these muscles work and then you can change the direction so you start to feel okay, these muscles are working. 
and you can go into the inside. These muscles are working and you can just find different angles, different positions that help you retrain the muscles to actually feel like they can work um, in different directions and different positions. That, doing those on airplanes, uh, we've made a video recently, doing things like that on airplanes can make airplane li rides uh, infinitely more comfortable. <laughs> well, and I love it. I love the exercises that you can do when no one can see that you're doing exercises. So there's no embarrassment factor when you're at the office or on an airplane or anything like that. No, that was really great. And I love that you have a sequence of things. I, I, I work similarly, which is why I stalk you. Um, so uh, in that it's really important. Like, for example, I come from a Pilates background and we do bridging all the time in Pilates. But um, it's so much more powerful when you do a bridge after you've done a couple things that will allow the bridge to work better. There's just more power power in it, you know, so yeah. I appreciate that. Awesome. Um, give us the website for the FAI fix. It's uh, the FAI fix. You can find at the FAI fix.com. There is a the in front of it. So it's the FAI fix.com. Okay, cool. And I do have one more question for you. Just, I, I love hearing these, the personal stories from people and I know, and you know, I, you know, I met actually in person a couple months ago and you told me yep. your personal story about what got you into all of this. And I know it has to do with your hip. So if you can really quickly tell us, a little bit about your own personal pain journey. Sure. Um, so, you know, if I keep the story just to the hips, I, uh, as I told you earlier, I'm, I was a hockey goalie all, for a very long time. And um, when I was 16 or 17, uh, I pulled my hamstring and groin so badly that I was on crutches for several days and uh, screaming in pain, trying to work the clutch on my, my stick shift car. And um, that actually just didn't heal. Um, and, you know, when I was younger, doctors just told me to rest it and it would eventually get better. And uh, it just didn't. And I just compensated around it. And over time, it's, you know, I, it just started to manifest itself in different ways. Um, you know, my, my knees would start to feel funky and I just felt like it was unstable. I couldn't do certain motions. Uh, it would hurt when I was sitting for a while. So anyway, by the time I got to my mid twenties, my hips, uh, deteriorated pretty badly to the point where I'm just stepping over a bench, like the one I'm sitting on here, just being able to do this was just not possible. Like it would hurt way too much, Get, which getting in and out of the bathtub was a daily challenge because my hips would snap and pop and just feel terrible. I mean, it was like hard snaps in my groin um, every time I got in and out of the bathtub. Um, and so basically I had to give up on a lot of activities. I couldn't, I really couldn't safely play hockey anymore. Tying my shoes actually made my low back hurt. Um, pretty much any activity that, you know, you can think of that you as a you know adult would want to do just running walking jumping you know whatever it is i couldn't do it and um you know there was pain everywhere else in my body as well so um for me uh the journey that i've gone through and trying to solve my own issues has really helped open my eyes to a lot of things and also helped me help other people see clearly what's going on with the body and see clearly how you can gradually make changes that make your body feel, you know, literally amazing. <laughs> so. Well, and surgery is just, I know that the FAI problem usually goes with surgery. It's just a much tougher option. I mean, if you can do a couple exercises a day, wouldn't you rather do that? I know I would rather do that. I'm sure you agree. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I think um, for some people, I, I do want to, I do want to say that I think for some people it, it is actually as simple as do a couple exercises a day. Yeah. And then there are other people for whom it, it takes a while. Mm -hmm. um, we worked with we work with a number of people here who have had the FAI diagnosis, and for some people it does take months of of really learning what's going on with their body. Um, it's it's not a process that you can just say okay, done. It's just like that. Um, we've had people who took, you know, three, four, five, six months to really get a handle on what was going on for them. But once they really understood it right? Then they have control. Yeah. And like the thing I point out to people is, you know, if you have a, a musculoskeletal problem and you're going to see a, a specialist, the person you're seeing, you know, if it's a typical medical scenario, if you're seeing that person for this problem in your entire life, you'll probably see them for a total of 30 minutes. Yeah. And in that time frame, 
you have to ask yourself if it's reasonable to expect that they're going to be able to understand the entirety of your history and the entirety of what your body can and cannot do and what it should and should not be able to do. Yeah. yeah. So you as a person live with your body 24-7. If you take the time to explore what's going on, you're going to have so much more information that's going to be so much more valuable than what an outside source can tell you in 15 to 30 minutes. Absolutely. Well, and, and back to the whole daily exercise thing, it's like brushing your teeth. I mean, once you figure out that the, the benefits of brushing your teeth or the benefits of doing your exercises, then you keep doing your exercises. You can stay healthy forever until, you know, age 90 and 100. So it is far more powerful to have the control in your own hands and to know. Yes. yes. Amen. <laughs> so awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I will. Uh, I hope that people watch this and learn some stuff and go to your website and sign up for your program. And thank you for being inspiration to me and all the other people that you help out there. Thanks so much. And you've been inspiring me as well with all you're doing. So keep up your good work. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll end the little cheesy part of this video. And um, I will see you. Uh, I'll see you online. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. <laughs>